short introduction. 25 years ago, I was living in Madison, Wisconsin, working very hard in graduate school, and I heard a rumor. There was a rumor that went around the school and my fellow students at the University of Wisconsin about this fellow who was going to be coming to Wisconsin, but it would take a while for him to get there because he wasn't driving in cars. He was walking from Montana. <laughs> and he also had some other interesting behavioral characteristics. He was said to uh, not be speaking. And a lot of people said, hmm, this is going to ruin the reputation of our graduate school to allow a student like this to come to Madison, Wisconsin. But a few people said, no, I think you better think more about this fellow. And uh, he turned out to be quiet, <laughs> but not unexpressive. He didn't ride in cars, but sure did get around a lot. John and uh, my, our lives intersected briefly at that point. Actually, after that, intersected more and more often. And they've intersected again recently as John has returned to the University of Wisconsin to teach. So um, I'm not going to say too much more because I know John is his own best storyteller, except to say that I'm really, really, really uh, honored, delighted, pleased that this good friend of mine can join with so many other good friends of mine in this room and that uh, he is returning also to Chicago after a long trail that has led in so many interesting places. So please welcome uh, my good friend John Francis. Thank you for being here. And, and I always start <laughs> speaking by playing some music, and there's been a lot of music here today. And, and by saying those words, thank you for being here, because uh, when I started speaking after 17 years of silence, I didn't speak for 17 years, yes? And um, those are the first words that I said. The first words that I spoke were, thank you for being here, because I was thanking the people who had come to hear me speak, including my mother and my father and, and uh, the, the news media, because um, after 17 years I was going to start speaking um, in Washington, D.C. on the 20th anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, the 20th anniversary of Earth Day. So um, I'm thanking you all for being here now, uh, because it always takes two to communicate, at least two, someone to send a message and someone to listen. And, and I want to talk to you about those things, listening and walking across the United States. And 
walking across America. So I'm thanking you for being here. And when I said those words back in uh, 1990 on the 20th anniversary of Earth Day, my mother, who was sitting in the audience, she jumped up and she said, Hallelujah, John is talking. <laughs> if you can imagine, you know, not hearing your um, child speak for 17 years because he took a vow of silence or something and he started speaking. My, my mother was very happy to hear me speak. And, and my dad, I better look at my clutch because I don't want to keep you guys waiting here. So my dad, you know, he was sitting out in the audience too and he just looked at me and he said, that's one. Now, my father said that, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to say all the stuff that I saved to last right up front because I don't want to run out of time without having said all the important stuff. Uh, <laughs> my father said that's one because he would follow me all over the country telling me that, listen, you have to ride in cars and talk. <laughs> you know, I would get a degree and he would say, you, that's wonderful, John, but you have to be able to ride in cars and talk. <laughs> and so he was saying that was one, that's one. You know, we wanted to see the number two. And uh, when I, the words came out of my mouth, I, I kind of turned around and looked to see who was saying what I was thinking because I didn't recognize my voice. And I realized it was me and I started to laugh. I went, <laughs> really? <laughs> my dad saw me and I could see him. He's going, yeah, he really is crazy. <laughs> Look at him. He's there laughing and giggling. Um, but I'm really happy to be here, and I'm really happy to be here with many of my friends. Thank you very much, Kurt and Peter, who's uh, very close in the work that we do. I want to tell you right away what I discovered when I gave up riding in cars and, and walked across the United States listening, not speaking. I want to get that out of the way. I'm telling you, I'm telling you all the important stuff right up front. Um, it's almost like a statistic, but... It's, it's not. This is not a statistic. But I, I feel that you already know this, that, you, that this is one of these times when, you know, I come to a place and I, and I start to say what I'm saying and, and, and that nobody's going to be surprised. So I'm going to say that I discovered that we are the environment. I stopped riding in cars because of pollution. I, you know, that's what I thought was the environment. It's about in polluting the environment. But then I discovered, as I walked across the United States um, and listened, uh, not talking, playing music, and meeting many, many wonderful people, that people are the environment. Wendell Berry said that. He said, well, we are the land. The land is us, and, and we are the land. Which is the same thing as saying people are the environment. But what I discovered as I walked across the country, yes, people are the environment, so therefore, our first opportunity, our first chance to treat the environment in a positive way or a sustainable way, or even to understand what sustainability is, because we use that word a lot. Sustainability, sustainable, is in the relationship we have with ourselves and with each other. So, Environment to me is about human rights and civil rights and economic equity, gender equality, all the ways that we relate to each other. It is about relationships, but the relationships begin right with us, with how we treat each other. And that's the lesson that I learned after it took me 17 years of walking across the United States and not saying nothing and studying at the university to get to that place, but I think you're already there, which is just another amazing thing. Because when I started in 1972 walking, well, I'm going to tell you that story. I'm going to go back to that time when the, when the oil tankers collided, and there was a big oil spill in San Francisco Bay, and I was listening to the radio with my girlfriend, Jean, and we decided we were going to go drive down there to San Francisco and see that spill. I've never seen no spill before. <laughs> I heard there was one in Santa Barbara. Did you hear that, Jean? Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> um, Jean didn't really sound that way. 
Um, but this is what we call a theatrical device. <laughs> this is California, and I don't want to confuse you, right? Um, I don't see it because it's, a, it's lots of clouds, a lot of clouds, and it, it was all foggy. We couldn't see the spill. But what we could do, we could smell it. We could smell the spill before we got there. We could smell the spill when we left, when we turned around and headed back to our little town in Northern California, Inverness, on the way back. The smell never left us. That was 40 miles away, and we could still smell it. That was the first time that I realized that the environment and something that happened inside the environment was something that could be so big that you couldn't get away from it. You couldn't turn the page and go, oh, what's going on next? It was with us, and so on the way back, I said to Gene, I said, you know, what we should do, baby, we are girlfriend and boyfriend, see? Okay. I said, what we should do, we should start, we got to do something. Let's stop riding in cars. I mean, we could walk, see? I said, we could walk. You know, we could walk. And Jean, she said, listen, John, that's a very nice idea. But it takes money to do that. If we went walking right now, people would look at us and they'd say, look at those hippies. They don't even have no money. They can't, huh? They're. But if we had money, they'd say, look at the rich people. They're walking. They must know something. Come on, let's go follow them. Now, this was way before Forrest Gump. Come to think of it, he was rich. People were running after him. Well, that's what I said. Well, that's okay. I'm not going to do that. Gene, you're right. Let's wait for the money to come, and then we can walk. But there was a knock on our door one day. <coughs> yeah? Are you serious? Oh, man. That's terrible. Our friend and neighbor, and we live in a little town of 350 people, so we know each other. Our friend and neighbor, Jerry Tanner, was a deputy sheriff, was lost in Tamales Bay, a long, narrow bay, shallow, but storms could come up on there quickly. He was lost. His family was all right, though. They pulled him out, his kids and his wife. Now, we decided we were going to go celebrate Jerry's life by walking 20 miles to hear some music being played. I, I should tell you that Jerry, while he was our friend, he was a deputy sheriff. And, um, well, Gene was a kind of a horticulturalist. <laughs> <laughs> she grew these plants that... Jerry was always looking for and pulling up. <laughs> Suffice it to say that we did inhale a little. <laughs> but that's another story. He could be president now, right? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we decided we we're going to walk over the hill and hear a group from our community go over and play. Now, these people playing were called the Young Bloods. Anybody? Hear about the young, the young bloods? All the old people. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but probably you heard this song. Everybody's heard this. Come on, people now. Smile on your brother. Everybody get together. And if I sing more, then they have to, I have to pay them residual. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it just there. It was 20 miles. How many people here walked 20 miles? Okay, that's, that's a fair amount of people here. 20 miles, that's a long walk. And you know that if you left at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and you wanted to get someplace at 9 o'clock that night, um, you, you're not going to get there. We didn't get there till about 2 o'clock the next morning. And they were, you know, packing up, and they said, John, Gene, oh my goodness, you guys have walked all this way. Come on, we'll drive you back home. And we decided, no, we're going to stay, and we're going to walk back after a couple of days resting at the Holiday Inn. 
by the pool. <laughs> you don't need to suffer. But it was on that walk back that I started thinking about Jerry, because that's who we were walking for, you know, we're celebrating his life. Well, Jerry was the same age I was. He was about 26 years old. He had a, a beautiful house and a, a, a white picket fence around it, a beautiful family, and a great job, and he was white. He had everything. He was living the American dream. But just like that, Jerry was gone. And it was that walk back and Jerry's whole life and having things and his vision and my, I said, you know what, Gene? There is no guarantee, and here's the other important thing, there is no guarantee tomorrow is going to happen for us. There is no guarantee that the money's going to come, ever. All we know is that we have this moment right now. This is it. This is the moment that we have. And guess what? We're walking. I'm going to just keep on walking right now because I'm not waiting for the money. And Jean, she said to me with, God, all this love and emotion. And all, Bye. <laughs> <laughs> she was not that cold. <laughs> So he said, John, you know, you can keep walking, but I have all these things to do. I'm, I'm going to keep on doing. I'm going to see if we can get the money to come in, and then, you know, I'll join you. Um, to tell you right now, the money never came. And, uh, but I just kept walking. And I had to call my mother and father because, you know, I just wanted to let them know that, huh, their son was walking. We didn't have push buttons back in those days. <laughs> Hey, Mom, yeah, my mother's back in Philadelphia. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, no, no, right, I'm all right, I'm good, I'm happy, baby. Yeah, um, I'm walking, that's what I wanted to call you and let you know. I, I gave up riding in cars. A and yeah, motor everything. But for the environment. The environment, Mom. The environment, you know, like <laughs> air and stuff. Um, I don't think it's the environment's reached Philadelphia yet. <laughs> <laughs> my, my dad? Uh, oh, my dad wants to know why I didn't do this when I was 16. <laughs> I didn't know about the environment then. <laughs> Yeah, but listen, now I'm, I know I'm really happy. I'm walking. Uh, it, okay. My mom said if I was really happy, um, I wouldn't have to say so. Uh, mothers are like that. They say things like that that make you have to think. But so I just kind of walked around, and the town, like I said, it was just about 350 people, and they just, everybody knew what everybody else was doing, and, and they knew that I was walking. And so they would drive up along next to me and say, you know, get in the car, John. I'm driving you to Point Reyes. And I say, no, man, I'm, I'm walking for the environment. And they go, you know, one person cannot make a difference. One person is not going to make it. This is a big problem, oil spills. We're all sad about it, but one person can't make a difference. Hmm. Well, I argued and I argued and I argued until I got so tired of arguing that on my birthday, I decided that, well, you know, I'd been reading The Hobbit. <laughs> the Hobbit, they give gifts on their birthday. I've been reading, and I've been listening to The Beatles. Yeah, the Beatles, think about that. And they have this song, number nine, number nine, number, I was going to be 27 years old. That's nine three times. That must mean something. Yes, and so I decided that on my 27th birthday, I'm not going to talk for one day. I'm going to give my community a gift of my silence. And so I wake up on my birthday, and I'm not talking, and my community's there. <laughs> Yay, John, one more day, one more day. <laughs> well, um, I learned something on that day of not speaking. I learned that I had not been listening. I'll tell you what I used to do. 
I used to listen just enough to think I knew what the other person was going to say. And then, when I figured out what I thought they were going to say, I stopped listening to them because I didn't need to. Because I already knew. I could tell the future. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I already knew what they were going to say. So I stopped listening to them and started thinking about what I was going to say back to them to show them that I knew more. I could do it better. I could say it better. They were wrong. I was right. So that one day of not speaking, I learned that I had been doing that and I did have not been listening. And what I learned was that if I had been listening, I could learn things. People were going to say things that I didn't know, but I needed to listen to them. And so I thought, maybe I should be quiet for one more day. And so I was. I was quiet for one more day. And I learned more. I learned I couldn't lie when I didn't talk. <laughs> I had issues about telling the truth because I would make stuff up. And so I said, maybe one more day. I'll just not speak for one more day. Okay, a week went by. People in the town are getting worried. Oh, my God, this guy from Philadelphia, he's come out here and starts walking. And now, look at him, he doesn't talk. It's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. It's the beginning of the Aquarian age. I'm sure he's a sign. No, no, some people just said he's just crazy. <laughs> and some people said, no, he's just on a trip. Don't worry. <laughs> well, I better write my books because I've decided that I'm not going to speak for one year. And then when that year's up, I'll revisit it on my birthday and find out if it's time to talk. And that'll be okay, huh? Oh, airmail, huh? Um, I told my folks I didn't talk for one year. So, oh, your dad will be on the next plane. <laughs> <laughs> um, back in Philadelphia, I, I think they've been reading Life magazine, and they believe that I've been taken over by some strange religious cult out in California. <laughs> and uh, so my dad flew out to, to see, and I thought he was going to deprogram me or something, right? <laughs> no, I said, I was really nervous. Gene picked him up at the airport, and they came and drive, and they told me, you're on the road. And uh, they pull over and stop. My dad goes, son, it's so good to see you, and I'm so happy to see my dad. I hadn't seen him for such a long time. I, I grab his hands, and I could just feel him, and that, you know, it was just such a good feeling. And he says, I'm so happy to see you, son. And I go, <laughs> <laughs> and a big frown comes over his face. <laughs> Gene says, yeah, I told you. <laughs> says, well, we'll get in the car and we'll go up to the hotel. And I go, <laughs> okay. So they drive up to the hotel. I walk in uh, inside the hotel room. I'm writing notes to my dad because I'm trying to do mime to him and stuff. And he says, no, 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 no. no. Write it down, write it down. So I'm writing down how I want to go to school and how the environment's really important to me. And he's just kind of shaking his head. He calls my mother up says, yeah, he's here. No, he's okay. No, people seem to like him. <laughs> um, no, he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he's, I, I don't know, I, I just think we should leave him out here. <laughs> no, this, this wouldn't work back in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> and so they left me in California to just walk around and, uh, you know, be in nature, because where I lived, was, it was pretty natural, but I really wanted to get to a place that was wilderness. I mean, wilderness, I saw on a map, I looked at a map, I said, oh, there's a green spot right there. I'm going to walk right up to the wilderness in Oregon and count me off this wilderness. And I went in there and I walked through. Now, this wasn't like a big, you know, Yosemite kind of wilderness. This was low elevation canyons. You would go up and down, up and down, lots of rattlesnakes, hornets, and things like that. But for me, it was just this place where... Um, I still is, is that place for me to go and, and be refreshed. Uh, but this is a nice place too, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we could be refreshed here in, in nature. It's the nature because I, I believe that nature is really healing. And when I came out of the wilderness, um, I met some miners there who were mining gold. And they said, listen, the real gold, we only take enough gold for, to make our living. The real gold, John. The real gold is that we live here. And um, so there's a different kind of mining operation. 
you know, different kind of minor, different kind of mentality. And so I kind of took that on. That was another lesson for me. And when I came out of the wilderness, I went to school because I saw this school in Ashland, Oregon, uh, Southern Oregon State College. So I went to see the register. <laughs> so um, I'm guessing here, but I, you want to go to school, right? <laughs> and they said, you know, they had a special program for people returning to school because I got to tell you this. I had tried college once before after high school. I went to college, and I guess it wasn't for me because I dropped out. But I didn't drop out. I just walked away after a, first, a few quarters. A quarter, I just walked away. And all my grades turned to Fs. So if you ever do that, if you ever go to school and you say, well, I think I'm going to go do something else, remember to withdraw <laughs> <laughs> from your classes. This, is, this was very painful for me. The W stands for wise. Be very wise, withdraw from your classes, and so that when you go back, you won't go back to um, Fs, which is for, stands for foolish and follow you the rest of your life. As you change and you say, hey, I want to go to school again, and you say, well, let's see your grades. Oh, I didn't go to that. That still counts. <laughs> oh, well, you got a minus three grade point average. What's that, <laughs> what's that about? Uh, and then you have to do a lot of explaining of it. If you don't talk, then it's even, you know, <laughs> it's even harder. Uh, but I went to school and in two years uh, was able to graduate because I did this prior learning experience portfolio where you could say what you did in your non-academic life and get credit for college courses. Walking, for example, a thousand miles every year up to Oregon and back, that was worth one credit. You know, for physical education. And, <laughs> and music, I, I, com I kind of supported myself playing music, so I got string theory. That's not physics. Yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, then there was like 12 credits, 12 credits for nonverbal communication. <laughs> I walked into the professor's office. He just said, And it went like that on things that I had done. I kept these. I knew about the, the, um, the nature of the Kamiasis wilderness, those kinds of things. So I graduated in two years. My, my dad came out to see me graduate. And he says, look, son, you know, he, we're very proud of you. You graduated college, finally. But, you know, what are you going to do with a bachelor's degree? You don't ride in cars and you don't talk. What is this? <laughs> I hunched my shoulders. I grabbed my banjo, put my pack on, and I head out again. I graduated with this goal to walk and sail around the world in a spirit and hope that I could be a benefit to humankind. No clue what that meant. Really, I just figured I would learn on the way. And um, I didn't have any money. I did all that school with working, playing music, and grants and loans. Well, I learned how to build wooden boats back in California. And I founded a nonprofit organization called Planet Walk, and, and I left, walking around the world. Walking around the world, um, yeah, I told my mother, because I, I called up, and I did speak, I said, um, after 10 years on my birthday, I called up my parents, and I said, hi, mom, dad, no, this really is your son. <laughs> no, no, it's my brother's name is Dwayne. My mother's like going, come on, Dwayne, stop playing around. It's uh, No, and she said, well, tell me something that only you and I know. And I told her something, and she just, I'll tell you what it was, because once she had come out to see me, and we were up gone, I walked, went up to the elevator to see some people that we knew in San Francisco. I had walked to town. And then on our way back, we're going down in the elevator, and my mother, this is mother's, right? She leaned over to me, and she said, you know, if you had serious about this non-motorized vehicle deal, you wouldn't be riding in an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> it's my last elevator ride. Damn. <laughs> I used to get happy. I'm getting on the elevator. <laughs> but now, you know, I had to walk up the stairs. Um, <laughs> even I wasn't perfect. Uh, but my mother said that, and so I told her that, and she says, oh, my God, it's, it is you. And I said, listen, I'm getting ready to walk 
around the world. You'll probably hear it. It's in the media now. Uh, but don't worry about it. I love you and everything's going to be okay. And then I didn't speak for another seven years. As I walked from California back up to Oregon to Port Townsend, Washington, I built a boat. Rode it across Puget Sound and sold it and kept walking across the state of Washington, Idaho, into Missoula, Montana. And I got to Mo Missoula, Montana to go to the school there because I took an application for graduate school, a master's in environmental studies. And they wrote me back and said, oh, that's great. When are you going to get here? And I said, oh, about two years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking. And they go, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> and so I did. I got there in two years. And I love to tell the story because, you know, I told you I didn't have any money. How can you do this without money? How can you do your stuff? Don't wait for the money. That's my advice. Do not wait for the money. Start doing whatever it is you got to do. Do that. The money will come. And so there I am at school. I walk up to this, the, the graduate school there, and I'm standing at Jeanette Rankin Hall, and up comes the director of the program. He says, you must be John Francis. Well, I had a banjo and a backpack. I'm sure he just, and I didn't say nothing. <laughs> so he says, are you ready for school? And I go, he says, oh, you don't have any money. Come back tomorrow. It's the last day to register. We'll take care of that. Okay, I'm back there early in the morning, standing around, seeing how they're going to take care of this. He says, there's $150. Go register for one credit. Okay, I go up. He says, you're going to go to South America, right? I have no idea what's Rivers and streams of South America, he says. One credit, reading and conference. So I register for one credit and come back. He says, okay, now we can give you a key because now you're matriculating here. You can use the library. And this is what we've done. We've talked to all the professors of courses you have to take. And now you'll be able to take those courses. You're not registered for them, but they'll, they'll give you the grade that you earn and keep it for you. And when we figure out how to get the money, you'll register for those courses, and we'll give you those grades. <laughs> Creative financial assistance. So I didn't think that was some part of the finance. You know, if you have that at going to school, where they take you to college and say, hey, don't worry about, <laughs> don't worry about money. Just, but that's what happened. I mean, because I didn't have any money. And... Uh, I graduated with a master's degree. I had actually taught classes. I taught about forestry and all that kind of stuff without talking. I would make these. <laughs> <laughs> My class would go, oh, what's he talking about? He's, he's talking about clear cutting. I said, you can't talk about clear cutting like that. He's using a handsaw. You can clear cut with a handsaw. No, oh, no, 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 that's selective forestry. And I'm just kind of backing out going, I would, they would say things that I didn't mean, and, but I should have, right? <laughs> and so they thought I was really very smart. Uh, <laughs> God, he's so smart. You know, he knows everything. <laughs> uh, I just took credit for that. But um, no, I left there knowing that if you were a good teacher, probably you were, have to be learning as well. And if you uh, weren't learning, you probably weren't a good teacher. So um, I graduated. My dad shows up again. Listen, son, we really want to tell you, huh? We're proud of you, but what are you going to do with a master's degree? You've got to ride in cars. You've got to talk. <laughs> I chug along. And I go all the way across the United States, all the way through Watertown, South Dakota. There I'm working as a printer, and I make application to the University of Wisconsin, other universities as well. But the University of Wisconsin is the one that came back and said, um, we think that we can support you here at our university. And what they did say is that after I was accepted there, they said, well, you know, we sat around and talked about this, and we decided that if you don't find five professors here to work with, you're not going to find them anywhere. So uh, we might as well have you come here, <laughs> and which is what happened. I went there, and I started writing on oil spills, because that's why I was walking. Oil spills, and my colleagues came up to me and said, John, that's great, um, but what kind of job are you going to get? Job? I, 
didn't know I they needed a job. Well, they were paying me to go to school. I was a fellow. Hmm. Well, that was all very well and good. I mean, I didn't know if anybody was interested in oil spills. But in 1989, when I finished my final exam, and um, something happened, you know, that made us all interested in oil spills. Exxon Valdez. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's what happened. And so there was the government calling this guy up and, huh. yes, we'd like to speak to uh, this Mr. Francis. He says, doing oil spill studies here at the university. The Admiral. He, he, he doesn't talk. <laughs> nor does he ride in motorized vehicles. <laughs> hmm. um, is there someone normal there <laughs> that we can talk to? Well, they did talk to my major professor, and uh, you know he answered all the questions that needed to be answered. And I had passed my major exams, and I was ready to go off and do my research. And so, who comes again to see me? Dear old dad. Remember, he always shows up. He may not get it, <laughs> but he's always there, and he's always saying, this is what I believe. What do you believe? Mm. <laughs> this time he shows up and he says, huh, my sister says I should leave you alone because you seem to be doing a lot better when you're not saying anything. <laughs> and uh, that was true. I seemed to be doing a lot better than, you know, before when I was talking all the time. That, that kind of a way. Um, so uh, my dad says, look, we're really proud of you, you know, but, you know, you've got to drive in cars and talk. You know, PhDs are a dime a dozen. Sorry. <laughs> And um, uh, and so I put my backpack on and, and walked again and and till I got to Washington, well Cape May, New Jersey. Put my foot in. That was seven years and one day. Wow, it's in 30 minutes, huh? Okay, uh, seven years and one day, I reached the East Coast to the East Coast, and and on the 20th anniversary of Earth Day, I started speaking and I said thank you for being here, uh, and uh, all that stuff happened. I was made a UN Goodwill Ambassador for the environment program. And also, I went to work for the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard hired me, even though I didn't ride in cars. But, you know, I could answer the phone anyway. So um, the boss who, I was hired up in uh, Vermont. I was in Vermont at the time when they hired me, Peter. And they said, OK, um, so how can you get down here? We can give you a, a ticket to fly down here. And I said, oh, no, I don't use tickets. Uh, to fly, because um, he said, well, train, we'll reimburse you. I, nah, train. He says, Dr. Francis, you don't ride in cars, do you? And I, I said, no, I don't. Um, they go, we'll get back to you. The next day they called back and he said, well, our boss said, we have to have you here. How can you get here? And I said, well, I can ride my bicycle. I said, well, how, how, how long will that take? I said, about two months. <laughs> we'll be waiting. So I called my dad right away and said, Dad, Dad, I got a job. I got a job. You know, dads like that, that you got a job. <laughs> I got a job with the Coast Guard, man, the Coast Guard, the, the U.S. Coast Guard. <laughs> do they know who I am? I don't know, I guess. Who do they think I am? I don't know, Dr. Francis. My dad said, the world certainly has changed. <laughs> and and it, not only because I had a PhD, but because he remembered me with these signs walking around all over different places. Even here in Chicago, I, I worked for the American Friends Service Committee, and I, would, I had signs. I was a community organizer out on the west side uh, on Jackson Avenue Project House, and we had signs. And um, my dad said, mm, they're not going <laughs> to, they're not, they're not going to, you're not ever going to work for the government, at which I didn't really care at that time at all. But now I had a big admiral's desk in the Coast Guard and I was working for the government and writing oil pollution regulations for the United States. Now I want to just go back to when I had started because this journey, I want to say, is a metaphor for all the journey that we're on. This is the same journey because I'm here. I'm right here right now. And you're here, so you're part of my journey. You're part of this. And so I must be part of your journey. I must be because here I am. And so I just want you to know that this is a metaphor for all of our journeys. This, you know, and there's going to be some of you want to go, I'm going to go walk. There's going to be some of you say, I'm not going to walk, but I'm going to do 
you've got your own journey. You've got your own way of walking. And that's going to happen. It's going to happen, and you just got to, it's coming right out of this place where you have to just let it be. I know it sounds crazy. This is crazy. But if someone said to me back 20 years earlier and said, John, you want to make a difference? I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to start walking east. Start walking east, John. Yeah, pick up that banjo, too. And as I got a little further on, this is going to make a difference? <laughs> and I said, yeah, and shut up. <laughs> You're going to make a real difference. You know, I would have thought that they were messing with those plants, you know. Um, but that's what happened. I mean, 20 years later, there I am in Washington, D.C., with a Ph.D. and an admiral's desk, and I'm writing the oil regulations for the United States the oil spill regulations, the transportation for the United States. Well, I'm going to end there to say that this is your journey. You're all way ahead. When I left California not speaking and playing the banjo and thinking and meditating on environment, if I said to someone, environment, they'd look at me like I was crazy. You're at the place where the environment is like, it's in our, our language. It's just like what we talk about. We're having a conversation, and now what we do about it, what we do, and we've already got to this place today where we understand that we are it. We are the environment. And so our first chance to treat the environment in a positive way is with each other. So... Um, that's all I have to say. I did walk the length of South America, and uh, that was a long walk. <laughs> and now I'm married, and I have kids. And uh, they're making a movie out of this book called Planet Walker. And this, this tune that I've been playing is called Celebration of Life. And it's what I started playing when I first learned how to play the banjo. I, I made it up. <laughs> and you're all part of it. for being here. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks very much.